1095, Pope Urban II preached a sermon at the Council of Clermont calling for military support for Christians in the Byzantine Empire, which was the eastern part of the former Roman Empire. You see, following the death of Muhammad in 632, Muslims had reacted in earnest, pursuing the logical philosophy of Islam, which according to Professor Thomas Madden, chair of history at St. Louis University, has always been expansion by way of the sword. And so Palestine, Syria, and Egypt were the first to give way to conquest. North Africa and Spain followed, as did Turkey, which had been a Christian territory since the time of Paul. But in the 11th century, the West responded to the plight of the East, and thousands of soldiers, mercenaries, and civilians took up arms and went to fight to reclaim the territories taken by the Muslim insurgents. This was the first crusade of the Middle Ages. The Crusades, as you know, went on to become one of the most controversial and dark periods in the history of Christianity. The name of Christ was abused and blasphemed by many of the actions of those involved. Thousands were forced to convert to Christianity under the threat of death and the opportunity for great lengths of evil abuse of power was taken full advantage of. There is nothing biblical about conquering cities, murdering innocents, or pillaging communities, even in the name of Christ. But this was a complicated time. It was a complicated time both religiously and philosophically and politically. And we might well ask ourselves today, as we look back from the armchair of post-enlightenment postmodern, post-Christian civilization at these atrocities and say, what would I have done if I was a Christian in the 11th century and my king asks me to fight to defend my faith? What would I have done if the greatest Christian leader of that time pleaded for the help of all Christians to stop the slaughter and persecution of other Christians oppressed by a brutal regime? The question becomes a bit more complicated without the 21st century editorial that acknowledges the evil of the Crusades we know to be true. Because questions of religion and politics, of faith and nation, are difficult ones, admittedly. Without resorting to caricatures or straw men that we set up only for our own devices, it's difficult to navigate the waters of God and country but we need to do that. I've so enjoyed our summer series, True Patriot Love, because it has invited us to wade into the difficult waters of challenging and stretching our faith and our biblical competency to understand how do we be patriots and Christians? Can we be patriots and Christians? So I'm really excited to get to be a part of the dialogue for the next two weeks preaching on, on this topic. So will you please turn with me to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to read from 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. This is God's word to us. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. It's the word of the Lord. I want to do three things this morning as we seek to apply his word to our lives. The first is to demonstrate the consistency of scripture as we see here the apostle Peter delivering the same message we saw from Paul last week as Derek preached on Romans chapter 13. 
There is a consistency of message, a harmony between the two apostles that is one of the hallmarks of Scripture. An internal consistency, which is incidentally one of the many differentiators of the Christian faith. It is internally consistent with itself. So we're going to see the consistency of message through this portion of Peter's teaching with what we have already learned from Paul. The second thing I'd like to do is throughout this passage highlight the balance that is required between the believer's interaction with authority and with the sovereignty of God. The balance between interacting with authority while ultimately acknowledging the primary authority of the God of the universe. We're going to see that all over this text. And then thirdly, I like to illustrate this balance by looking back at the Old Testament story of Daniel. So we're going to go from 1 Peter to Daniel. Pastor Derek and I were just chatting before he left on vacation, and we realized that in this series, Marking Canada's 150th celebration, we haven't spent much time in the Old Testament. But there's a lot of information about uh, God's people interacting with governments and authorities all over the ancient world. So we thought it'd be a good idea to include some of that content. It can instruct us. So put your finger in Daniel chapter 2. I want to show you how Daniel poignantly models this delicate balance, honoring authority and honoring God. Then we're going to use the book of Daniel to illustrate our theme both this week and next week. So looking ahead, next week we'll consider some examples of civil disobedience from the first century paralleled again with Daniel and his friends under the Babylonian captivity in 600 B.C. So that's our plan. You ready? You ready? (laughs) Let's dive right in. The first letter of Peter is not written to Christians who are in a position of power, who are ready to launch a crusade, but rather to believers who were as a group still being dominantly oppressed by Rome. In fact, Peter's readers were spread out, known as the dispersia, spread out over over the land, in many different places, a mixture of Jewish Christians and Gentiles. Peter's writing around the late 60s AD, when incidentally a few years later in AD 70 would be the fall of Jerusalem, which was a response to the Jewish rebellion, a time when Christians, rather than take up arms, would actually flee Jerusalem so that they were largely uninvolved in that conflict, and the Romans responded to the Jewish rebellion by destroying the temple in Jerusalem. But that's the tangent for history buffs. How were the early Christians taught, though, to interact with the authority that was effectively oppressing them? You remember from last week. Paul's teaching was that Christians should be subject to the governing authorities. That's Romans 13. Christians, as Pastor Derek has said, should be the best citizens. But it isn't just government that we should be subject to, is it? You wouldn't forget about Ephesians 5. This is Paul's word to the Ephesian church because he says there that Christians should be subject to one another. And then he goes on to talk about wives and husbands, children and parents, servants and masters. It seems as if for Paul, the idea of being subject is more than circumstantial. It's a lifestyle. And guess what? Peter backs him up. Our text today in 1 Peter is the parallel of Paul's lifestyle of submission. And Peter actually continues after this portion of scripture to talk about the marriage relationship and to talk about submission in the servant and master relationship. See, there's a harmony of teaching, and the teaching is this. For the Christian, our posture is submission, but as we'll see in a moment, our master is the Lord. Our posture is submission, but the posture of being subject to is not just a circumstantial event, it's a way of life for the believer. It's our natural state, mutual submissiveness. Now, there is more to this idea of mutual submission than meets the eye. Peter says in verse 13, be subject to every human institution. That could also be translated to every human being. Or your Bible might have it translated to every ordinance of man. Now that's pretty serious. We already know that the early Christian church was recognized for their posture of submission to one another. 
Their love for each other, their uncanny ability to submit and serve one another was what set them apart as a group. But now, submit to every human person and institution. That might have been a bit surprising even for them. It certainly might be a bit surprising for the 21st century Christian for us. Are we to be subject to every human being? Are we to be subject to every human authority? Are we to be subject to every human institution? Sounds like Peter is saying yes in 1 Peter chapter 2. Sounds like Paul is saying yes in Romans 13. Actually, Jesus himself said yes in Matthew chapter 5. The Beatitudes, if nothing else, are at least a description of the posture of submission to those around us. And Jesus uses the description of the person who wants to be his disciple and be called blessed as the introduction to his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Hold on a minute. There's a qualifier there, isn't there? Blessed are those who are purchased, persecuted for righteousness' sake. Not just any persecuted people. So what does Paul say in Ephesians chapter 5? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. What about Romans 13? Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except God. And what about our friend Peter in today's text? Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Do you see the magnificent harmony of Scripture? That's what I'm hoping that you will see. That's what I'm hoping that you'll look for when you study the word. It takes a little bit of effort, but anyone can do this if you have a little devotion and a concordance and maybe a good commentary. This is how you need to study the Bible because we can't base our faith or doctrine on one verse. We need to see the context of that verse, its relatedness to what else the scripture, the scripture teaches, and the whole counsel of God. That's important because there is a principle of balance here that is repeated in these various places that teach the same principle about our posture of submission. Believers are meant to live a lifestyle that is subject and cooperative with the authorities, and not just the authorities, but everyone around us, but we are living this way, knowing that our only real authority is God Almighty. So we're to learn a posture of submission, not just to God, but to other Christians, and even to unbelievers. That's why the posture of submission is used by both Peter and Paul to introduce their teaching about relationships between masters and slaves, or between husbands and wives, or between believers and the government. Because in all three of those situations, it would be highly likely in the first century and probably likely today that the authority could be an unbeliever. And so rather than teach that you are released from your obligations to those authorities because Jesus has made you free, the Bible teaches we should be subject to the authorities. Why, says Peter, for the sake of Jesus? For the Lord's sake. What does it mean for the Lord's sake? Well, at least it means for the sake of his office. He is Lord, not Caesar, right? So ironically, we, we honor Caesar because Jesus is Lord. We don't proclaim Caesar as Lord. We honor him because Jesus is Lord. I think it means for the sake of his glory. The glory of God manifest in the divine image. We respect every human being. We are subject to every human ordinance because every human being manifests the image of God created in mankind. Remember 1 Corinthians 11.7 says man is the image and glory of God. We had a series on the divine image just a couple months ago. I think it also means for the sake of his teaching. Be subject for the Lord's sake, meaning the sake of his teaching to model his teaching, to be a testimony to him, and share in his suffering. Peter's going to talk a lot about suffering for Christ. You can write down 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13, because he talks about that which is related 
to, to this teaching here in 1 Peter 2. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him. Peter in those two verses, 13 and 14, introduces the posture and also, consistent with Paul in Romans 13, affirms the role and responsibility of government to maintain order and execute justice in society. All for the Lord's sake. So... Our posture as Christians is submission, but our only true master is the Lord, and that sets up a balance, not just for the individual believer, not just for you, but also for the authority. Because when authority operates outside of the sake of the Lord, when government does not meet the responsibility God has laid out to be just and righteous and maintain order, it forfeits its right of subjection of those over which it rules. We're going to get to that next week and talk more about that. But our posture is submission. Our master is the Lord. Secondly, our motive is God's will, but our caution is the temptation to sin. Look at verses 15 and 16. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Here is another balance set up by Peter. First, he identifies one of the purposes for our submissive submission posture, which is to silence opposition to Christ. Essentially, it's a testimony of the truth of the gospel and the righteousness of God. Your submission is not because those in authority, especially if they're not believers themselves or Christian institutions, it's not because they're right or righteous, but rather to demonstrate that you, the follower of Christ are right and righteous in your faith. Did you hear that? God's reason for your posture of submission to authority, God's purpose for you being a good citizen, God's reason behind you being a patriot is not because your ruler is necessarily right or righteous, but rather to demonstrate that you, the follower of Christ, are right and righteous in your faith and that he is Lord. The fact that we're followers of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, whose blood has taken away our sin, whose sacrifice has made us not guilty before God, the fact that we belong to him and nothing can separate us from his love gives us tremendous freedom as believers. But in this freedom, as we see in verse 16, in this freedom, we could be tempted to sin. So Peter balances God's will and purpose for us, which is our motive for submission. He balances it, warning us not to sin because of your freedom. Now, how could this happen? Is that really something that is within the realm of possibility? Many of you I know are parents who have raised children all the way to be teenagers. Do you remember what happened when you gave them the freedom to take the car out? Did that come with any temptation? Did the responsibility of adulthood come with any potential pitfalls? Of course it does. That's an easy one. It's a bit funny because we've all been teenagers and we know what that's about. But what about those crusaders? That's a bit more serious. You think they started out with the intention of committing war atrocities? Maybe some were opportunistic, but some were genuine Christians following a call. But the freedom they had in knowing they fought for the truth and for the true God presented the opportunity for abuse and heinous sin when they took up the sword to defend their faith. So Peter's caution is real. And he's echoing Paul by setting up the balance for the believer of dealing with authority. Our posture is submission, but our master is the Lord. Our motive is God's will, but our caution is the temptation to sin. Finally, our disposition is general, but our allegiance is specific. Our disposition is general, but our allegiance is specific. I know that requires some explanation. So look at verse 17. This is a really cool verse because to understand it, we need to understand the literary device that he's using. Verse 17 says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. When you read it, you kind of get the sense that there's something going on here, right? Seems a little bit interesting, kind of 
put there out of nowhere, four short, deliberate sentences back to back. And there is a, a literary device being used. It's called a chiasmus. And it simply means that the rhetorical argument follows a pattern of A, B, B, A, where one idea is represented as the bookends and another idea is represented in the middle. The A's are the bookends, the B's are the middle. A, B, B, A. Now, you all know about this literary device. You have all heard this literary device in use. Let me give you an example. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. You heard that? Why is that little exhortation from John F. Kennedy so memorable and so powerful? Because it uses a literary device that is designed to be impactful. The chiasmus is used all over the Bible, both in Greek and Hebrew. But interestingly, one of the purposes of this literary device is to demonstrate balance. So isn't it interesting that we are studying the balance of submission to authority with the sovereignty of God, and look how Peter uses this. Honor everyone and honor the emperor are the bookends. Love the brotherhood and fear God are in the middle. So honoring everyone and honoring the emperor or the state is the general disposition of the believer. Contrasted with, contrasted with loving the brotherhood and fearing God, the specific allegiance. The middle is the qualifier. The middle is our specific allegiance. We fear God because he's our ultimate authority. We love the brotherhood. What's the brotherhood? It's the church. We love the church because it's our specific allegiance. You see what he's saying? While we are subject to everyone, we especially give our devotion and commitment to the body of Christ. While we respect the government, our primary and deepest commitment is to God. So when the two come in opposition, where do we go? We go to the center. We go to our specific allegiance. That's the balance we need to hold when we submit to authority. So Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2 are not telling us that Christians should collaborate with an immoral state or be yes men to a corrupt government or cower in the corner when uh, an injustice is being perpetrated on the weak. No. The Bible is saying that, yes, our general disposition should be one of cooperation, even patriotism to our government, but if push comes to shove, we belong to God. He alone is our ultimate authority. Now, at times, that can be a tricky balance. It's a whole lot easier to just say, well, we believe in the separation of church and state. We don't want to have anything to do with the government. We just leave it over there. Don't talk about it here. Pastor Derek has already shown us it's not what the separation of church and state means at all. It would be really easy to retreat into a little corner or maybe to retreat within this building and not engage the heathen world around us. But God has called us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples. How do we do that? How do we strike that balance? Well, Daniel was a prophet who needed to strike that balance. And the Old Testament book of Daniel tells his story. It's an awesome story. There's no wonder that the adventures of Daniel are the material of so many favorite Sunday school stories because it's really exciting. The lion's den, the fiery furnace, you remember all that. But beyond the dramatic value of those events, there is a powerful theme of balance between fear of God and honoring the king. Do you remember what happened to Daniel? Here's the story in a nutshell. The Babylonians lay siege to Jerusalem. The people of God are taken into captivity. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. He orders that the best and brightest of the Israelite youths be brought into his court and educated in Babylonian philosophy and literature and language and culture for three years. And then they're prepared to serve the empire, which was actually enslaving their people. So Daniel and his three companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were found to be the best and brightest of the best and brightest. They were chosen by the king because they offered him better counsel, more dedicated service than any of the wise men or other counselors or magicians or sorcerers that he had in the court. And they're given new Babylonian names, Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Abednego. 
The full first half of the book of Daniel is devoted to the story of how Daniel and his friends remained faithful to God while serving within the government of a foreign nation that was hostile to God. And so the scripture we read this morning during the worship time was a prayer of Daniel in Daniel chapter 2 where he blesses God who sets up and removes kings. Remember Paul in Romans 13. And he gives God thanks for helping him to walk a very fine line and strike a very difficult balance between patriotism and the Lord his God. So the plot of Daniel chapter 2 is very simple. We don't have time to read it all. I'd encourage you to read Daniel chapter 1 and 2 maybe this week, maybe when you're working on the digging deeper questions, because it sheds great light on the themes that we're talking about. But the plot is very simple in Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And the dream disturbs him because it's a little bit weird. And he tries to find someone who can interpret the dream. But no one can interpret it. None of his trusted advisor, none of the magicians, none of the sorcerers can interpret the dream. But Daniel can interpret the dream. Because God has powerfully gifted him with this ability. So he does interpret it. And the king is so amazed and awed that he promotes Daniel to even greater responsibility and power within his government. That's it. That's the story. So very quickly, I want you to watch with me how Daniel strikes the balance between patriot and follower of God. The textual references will be on the screen so you can write them down, but I want to just move quickly through a few points that underscore how does Daniel strike this balance that Peter is teaching us in in 1 Peter chapter 2. Well, first, Daniel uses his gifts to serve his government. He used his gifts to serve the government. He and his friends didn't refuse to respond when the king inquired of them. They didn't refuse to cooperate with the Babylonian authority, but they did refuse to defile themselves with the king's food, which is the story at the end of chapter 1. That ended up working out well for them, both them and the, the Babylonians, because it made them stronger and better. Better servants than anyone who ate the king's food, which was unclean for the Israelites. But Daniel clearly is using his gifts in service of the king who has his people in captivity. Well, secondly, Daniel was respectful, skillful, and wise in dealing with the authorities. When Nebuchadnezzar realized that no one could interpret the dream, his response was to kill everyone. Kill all the wise men who worked for him, like corporate downsizing with the guillotine. He's going to get rid of them all, which included Daniel and his friends. But verse 14 of chapter 2 says, Daniel replied with prudence and discretion, to the captain of the king's guard who had come to kill him. And then he says, I'm paraphrasing Daniel now, there's no need to be drastic, don't get up in arms. Let me make an appointment with the king and see if I can help him. So Daniel is acting as a servant, even under the pressure of a ridiculously unfair govern, governing regime. His default posture is submission to the authority, but even beyond that is helpfulness when he himself is being threatened with death. So he's respectful, he's skillful, he's wise. But thirdly, Daniel relied on God to help him with his government work. You see, in this prayer in verses 20 to 23, where Daniel thanks God for revealing to him the deep and hidden things, and he praises God for making known to him the answer to the king's matter, Daniel was relying on God, not just to get him through a difficult time in his personal life, not just to carry him through unnoticed, but when when he was under forced subjugation to a king. Maybe we would describe that as working for a secular company, which is a really hostile environment. That's where Daniel was. But he actually relies on God, not just to get him through, but to do his work, to serve the king, Nebuchadnezzar, and serve him well. Daniel relied on God to help him in his service to king and country. But fourthly, don't forget that Daniel was a testimony for God in his public work. Daniel was a testimony for God in his public work. He didn't hide his faith. He didn't separate his allegiance to God from his job just because his job was serving a government that was hostile to God. Look at verse 27. Daniel answered the king and said, 
No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He doesn't just pray to God privately and ask him for help in doing his best, then clam up when he's on site in the hot seat. Daniel is unashamed to admit that it is God himself who is the source of all his skill and wisdom, and he gives glory to God for his vocational success. Daniel relied on God, but he was also a testimony for God in the public sphere of his work. And fifthly and finally, Daniel and his friends didn't pursue selfish gain, but they accepted promotion and prominence so that they could glorify God and influence for good. They weren't seeking gain for themselves, but they accepted promotion and prominence so that they could glorify God and influence for good. You see, Daniel could have allowed all the other experts to be killed when he knew that he could interpret the dream, but he doesn't do that. He could have used that as a stepping stone, as a little way in, as a way to promote himself through opportunistic navigating and corporate politicking. He could have let them all die while he was the only one left with the answer. But what did he do? He asked the king not to kill any of them. He said, don't kill anyone. Then he went on to do his civic duty of helping the king. So at the end of it all, what happens? Daniel receives a promotion anyways. Promotion to one of the most powerful positions in the Babylonian government. And what does he do with that power? He asks the king, in verse 46 to 49, he asks the king to give prominent positions to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego so they can be a voice for the Lord in the same regime that is ruling over God's people in captivity. The whole book of Daniel is filled with this balance between respect for authority and single-minded allegiance to God. That allegiance sometimes produces situations when we have to disobey authority that we would otherwise honor. It happens repeatedly in this book. We're going to see next week that this is taught to us in Scripture in the New Testament as well. That's the balance that is struck. It's the teaching of Peter. It's the teaching of Paul. It's the teaching of Jesus. And it's the example of people like Daniel. To walk that line and strike that balance for the sake of the Lord. So where does it leave us? I'll conclude just by saying this. That we are called as Christians to be in difficult circumstances. We are called to a challenge in this life on the way to glory. We're called to the challenge of suffering for the name of Jesus, which is true, We are also called to the challenge of living for Jesus in complicated moral, ethical, and philosophical context. It's a challenge of being holy and separated from the world while being engaged and present in the world so that we can fulfill God's great commission that we hang on our wall. We're called to enter the world knowing that our stand for Christ will get us in trouble. But we go nonetheless. We engage nonetheless. We have to do battle in our minds and understand, how am I supposed to behave in these situations? We don't cower from it. We engage it. So don't be afraid to talk politics, even here. Don't be afraid to study what God says about it. Don't be afraid to tackle difficult questions, wrestle with God about how you should vote or whether you should sign a petition or whether you should enlist in the military or if participation equals endorsement in such and such circumstances. These are questions the body of Christ needs to engage together because living at peace with everyone doesn't mean don't engage with anyone. Living at peace with everyone does not equal don't engage with anyone. If you speak the gospel, if you live the gospel, if you breathe the gospel, it will very often be a sword rather than a feather. So let me speak a sword to you in closing. Have you given to Caesar what is Caesar's this week? Have you respected those in authority over you? while honoring your primary allegiance to God? Have you been an example in every institution and situation and circumstance so that God would be highlighted and glorified even as 
you act in a posture of submission to those who are over you. Have you given to Caesar what is Caesar's? But more importantly, have you given to God what is God's? What belongs to him is your whole self. What belongs to him is your very life, your heart, your trust. Because only he can save you from the worst oppressor, the ultimate enemy, the most heinous regime, and that is the regime of our own sin that enslaves us. He can free us, and we become slaves to him. When he becomes our master, we have life in abundance. And only he can make life living in this world worth living. So let's pray. Holy Father, ruler of heaven and earth, thank you for your sovereignty over the nations. Thank you that you raise up kings and you take down kings. Thank you for teaching us in your word the delicate balance of interacting with authority while maintaining our allegiance to you. Thank you for the many in our congregation, Lord, who have had to walk that balance in other lands and other countries that are hostile to you. Thank you for those among us who have been persecuted for their trust in you, their faith in you, and their desire to proclaim you. Thank you for Pastor Kim, imprisoned because he was a danger to the state, because he would speak your name and held allegiance to your name. Thank you for a government that went on his behalf and negotiated his release and safe passage back to Canada. We rejoice as a church because we know that you are sovereign, but you have called us into difficult circumstances, Lord. So we give ourselves to you. We give our hearts to you and our lives to you, trusting you to go before us as we go into the world. In the name of Jesus and for his sake, amen.